So uh, this is not an exhaustive uh, uh, description of uh, the anatomy of uh, urinary bladder. Uh, it's in fact uh, just enough information to to uh, give you an idea of uh, what the bladder is like. Uh, so we call it functional anatomy. And it, as you can see, this is a very simplified diagram. You will get much more detail in your anatomy classes. Uh, this is like a ball-like structure the bladder is. Uh, we call it the body, uh, which then uh, comes uh, to this narrow part, uh, which is the neck of the bladder. So it gets continuous with the neck of the bladder. And the neck then passes through a thickened uh, external sphincter, which is made up of skeletal muscle. We will talk about this. Uh, and uh, this is the urethra, which then goes out uh, and is basically where the urine uh, comes from, uh, comes out of. Uh, this uh, triangular area is called the trigon. This is in the lower uh, section, uh, lower part of the body of uh, the bladder. This being the fundus, it's called the fundus, the elevated round shaped uh, top of the bladder. The importance of trigon is that uh, it uh, receives the ureters on its, uh, it's like a triangle, right? So the broad base has two ends where the ureter comes in and basically uh, drops the urine. Uh, this is where the urine comes in. So the bladder basically fills from bottom up. <clears throat> and then the, uh, it is a good description in, in the sense that uh, this, this uh, wall, this muscle uh, wall that uh, the whole bladder and the trigon is made up of, uh, then basically goes on to make the uh, posterior urethra, the neck of the bladder, uh, where there is a uh, uh, folding of the internal lining of the uh, bladder. We call it the internal sphincter. And, and as we study, it's not uh, a true sphincter. It's actually just a functional uh, sphincter. However, it's important. So this is just a, a brief overview of uh, the bladder and the epithelium is called transitional epithelium. Again, you'll be discussing this uh, a lot in your anatomy classes. Uh, but here, it suffice to mention that it's a very efficient, uh, it's efficiently, uh, uh, the architecture of it is very efficient and clever. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, arranged in a way to, know, uh, to not allow any seepage of water or urine uh, into the wall. Uh, also, it is folded from inside, uh, making uh, uh, smooth folds called rugae. Uh, so when you stretch the bladder, it's actually the rugae which straighten out uh, and not uh, uh, the, the epithelium is not stretched. So uh, there is no pressure uh, in routine uh, filling of the bladder. There is no pressure on the epithelium. So there is no chance of seepage, uh, leaking of uh, urine or water from inside the bladder into the blood. <clears throat> Uh, so this is uh, the importance of rugae. Uh, the trigon, I've, I've mentioned, it receives uh, ureters on uh, the top two corners. And the lower apex uh, is continuous with the posterior urethra right here. Uh, then the urethra passes through uh, the external sphincter and the urogenital diaphragm right here, which obviously is longer in males and very short in females. And then last point on this slide is that the whole thing, the whole bladder, is basically made of a very thick uh, muscle, a special muscle called the detrusor muscle. Okay. Now a bit more on the detrusor is that uh, the muscle, the muscle fibers are, are randomly placed. So this gives a, a lot of tensile strength to this big muscular thick wall, a ball-like uh, football-like structure that the urinary bladder is. Uh, and, and this random arrangement basically allows for symmetric uh, contraction and relaxation uh, of the bladder. If the fibers had been concentrically arranged or in a, in a specific band-like thing, then the pressure inside the bladder when it were contracting wouldn't be symmetrical, i.e. almost equal from all sides, but it would be uh, in, in, in bands, uh, pressure would also be exerted in bands. So that's, that wouldn't have been very efficient. But since you have all sorts of crisscross like arrangement of the detrusor, uh, when you contract the structure, so when it comes uh, contracting in towards its core inside, 
the pressure that this random arranged muscle exerts is uh, equal on all sides okay so uh, let's now talk about the internal sphincter uh, we, we 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 mentioned that it's a continuation of the detrusor uh, it's not a true sphincter which basically means that it is just a folding of the inner lining of the bladder uh, and it's not a specifically separate tissue it's just the folding of the epithelium uh, uh, it's not under conscious control so it's just a thickening it has a very important function uh, in that uh, the in the the tone that it sets basically prevents uh, uh, urine from coming down into the urethra uh, so basically this is what where we're talking the internal sphincter so when, whenever you have collection of urine uh, at lower volumes you don't necessarily want it dribbling down into the posterior urethra a, a point about posterior urethra is that when uh, you allow the urine to come down into the posterior urethra the contraction the micturation contraction which we'll be talking about in a bit they become strong and there's a sense of uh, fullness in the bladder a conscious sense of fullness so you feel like going to the to, to, to empty the bladder that's obviously inconvenient because at lower volumes uh, you don't need to go to the uh, to the loo uh, so that's why internal sphincter uh, comes in very handy in the sense that uh, when it has a, and it has an intrinsic tone so it keeps the urine uh, from dribbling down unnecessarily at lower uh, bladder volumes into the posterior urethra and actually the urine keeps collecting here uh, till it becomes significantly large in volume and then a sequence of event events uh, start which we'll discuss later in the lecture so uh, this is just uh, uh, there's an inherent tone that we we spoke about uh, and keeps uh, uh, the blood uh, the sphincter closed when the bladder is relaxed i.e in the filling phase uh, uh, and this is the structure of it so detrusor muscle since it's all made up of detrusor muscle when detrusor is relaxed it the the configuration of the fibers around the in, internal sphincter are such that uh, when the detrusor is relaxed the fibers they close the uh, aperture of the internal sphincter and when detrusor is uh, co contracted it sort of tugs on or pulls on uh, upwards uh, so that the aperture the internal sphincter opens up uh, uh, in, in that fashion and hence the urine now uh, is free to dribble down okay so this is uh, uh, basically about the, the detrusor uh, detrusor has a lot of stretch uh, receptors which uh, are the mainstay of the micturition reflex to be discussed shortly uh, and then we spoke about the internal sphincter uh, and its importance in keeping um, the the lower uh, volumes of, of, of urine from uh, triggering any sort of significant micturition reflex and that conscious sense of uh, filling of the bladder so that's that now we, we now we talk about uh, this is a, a, a uq a university question as well the nervous innovation uh, of the bladder um, the the urinary bladder is uh, unique in the sense that uh, it involves the control involves both involuntary autonomic nervous system reflexes mainly parasympathetic and on top of it it has voluntary control as well as we all know uh, children don't have it uh, infants don't have it uh, and they develop uh, when they are being potty trained for the first two, three, two to three years they keep wetting their diaper or their weddings because they don't have control conscious control over their urination but as they grow and the nerves are myelinated uh, they get control of uh, their urination and we, we will talk on uh, we'll talk about this in this slide uh, so basically the control of uh, micturation the, the control of the bladder is a unique mix of uh, autonomic uh, subconscious uh, paras uh, parasympathetic drive and voluntary control which comes directly from cerebral cortex so let's just uh, dive in uh, and and let's uh, pick up proceedings from the bladder upwards okay so this is the bladder and it's being supplied by mainly by the sacral cord sacral segment of the spinal cord and also the thoracolumbar cord uh, the nerves are not shown here uh, so basically the sacral cord uh, if you if you refer to this slide uh, which is a which is a basically a blown up part of this area uh, 
so this is the bladder this is the sacral component and you see parasympathetic fibers going into the bladder this is the blue thing they're going into the bladder they're supplying the main bladder uh, body uh, then you have uh, the same parasympathetic fibers going to the bladder neck that the posterior urethra so that's these are the para parasympathetic fibers okay they, they are part of the pelvic nerves which uh, go from spinal cord towards uh, the bladder now uh, the same spinal uh, the same pelvic nerves also carry sensory fibers sensory afferents from the bladder back to the uh, spinal cord so that's one thing to note uh, you you see another uh, so th that's so, sorry that's that's the sacral cord and that is uh, this segment of uh, the control of uh, this the whole bladder thing the parasympathetic nerve fibers arrive from arise from the sacral segment of the cord then you have the thoracolumbar side uh, extended from t11 to l2 and uh, as you can see if you can correlate this with this diagram it's the lumbar section basically uh, which uh, supply the sympathetics to the bladder and you see that it's quite an extensive uh, uh, supply of sympathetics to the uh, the fundal area the main body of the urinary bladder and also uh, the the trigon area uh, near the neck of the bladder this is an important point which i'll discuss just in a bit so as we are going from bladder upwards we spoke about the sacral segment you, you uh, parasympathetic parasympathetics should come into mind thoracolumbar segment sympathetics should come into mind then we go up and here we, we see that at the level of the brain stem specifically the pons you have a maturation center here which uh, we will touch upon later and then you have the highest uh, uh, highest area of the crns the cerebral cortex this is where the conscious control of respiration comes from this is where this is how you hold the uh, the urination when you don't want to go uh, and 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 when you do want to uh, uh, urinate this is where you control it from so the entire this entire uh, network uh, of control over the bladder is basically under the purview of your conscious control in the cerebral cortex okay uh, uh, just finishing off this whole diagram this is a good diagram to uh, learn how to draw it gives you the 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 location of the parasympathetics and the sympathetic so these are the two autonomic uh, nervous component of the bladder uh, you will also notice that a lower se sacral segments uh, there is a nerve coming out uh, called the pudendal nerve and it's going to the external urethra so uh, external uh, sphincter i beg your pardon so we 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 studied the internal sphincter uh, just a while back and now we're talking about an external sphincter this external sphincter is actually uh, a proper sphincter uh, it's made up of skeletal muscles which is interesting because skeletal muscles are under conscious control and indeed the pudendal nerve is a somatic nerve so this is where you i.e the cerebral cortex control the overall emptying and filling of the bladder by holding uh, on to the external sphincter so if you contract this sphincter the bladder will not empty and will keep on filling and it's when you consciously relax this uh, we call it it's a it's a learned reflex which we'll touch upon later on when you relax this uh, skeletal muscle this this sphincter then urine is allowed to come out okay so this is an important point to note you have sympathetics you have parasympathetics and you have somatic nerve uh, all innervating the bladder uh, and uh, these are the, uh, the the three levels of uh, the control this is another way of looking at it the spinal cord reflexes which is this and this then you have the maturation pons area which has a part to play in this and the and the, and the highest is the cortical and subcortical structures basically in the in the in the forebrain now uh, what exactly is the role of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system it's an important point and and has to be obviously mentioned when you get a question on nervous uh, innovation so very simply put parasympathetics are basically uh, they contract the bladder okay so they are motor in nature and when they get stimulated 
simply put, the bladder will contract and try to expel its urine out. Okay. Uh, so what do the sympathetics do? Uh, we we keep on we will keep on mentioning the micturation reflex. Micturation reflex very briefly at this point in, in the lecture is these are reflex contractions which uh, are incremental. So at low volumes they they are they are slight. They are less in uh, their amplitude. But as the volume collects in the bladder, the maturation reflex contractions, they increase in amplitude. Okay, so this is going on in the background uh, subconsciously, this, this maturation reflex. It's going on and on and on because the urine volume uh, keeps on being added into the urinary bladder. So this is something that uh, is at, at, at the backstage of uh, the bladder uh, functionality. Uh, uh, whether it will uh, lead to a significant uh, maturation uh, uh, reflex contraction causing the person to feel the urge to now you know uh, go and urinate uh, that will depend on what the eventual volume of urine is and how uh, uh, aggressive these contractions are okay so in that uh, in that reflex parasympathetics cause the contraction bit of the micturition reflex okay more on this in a bit sympathetics don't have a a part to play in the micturition reflex please uh, make a note of this once again sympathetics do not play a part in uh, the micturition reflex which is the mainstay of this lecture so what what do they do uh, a bullet point there are two bullet points about it two main headings one is they have a role to play in the in the filling of the bladder okay i'll explain it in a bit first i'm just giving you the outline so sympathetics their function is in the filling of the bladder and second uh, is is uh, closing off of the urine uh, flow into the urethra when there is uh, ejaculation so uh, seminal fluids together with sperms when they are using the urethra uh, you don't want urine to come in or the seminal fluid to enter into the bladder so this is where uh, the very important function of sympathetics come in they they close off uh, basically uh, this area here basically this is where they are rich in supply as well they close off this area so that there is no urine input into the urethra during the act of ejaculation so they seal it off and and that's uh, that's the second most important function going back to the filling function if you if you if you look at the way they are arranged they are numerous clearly uh, all uh, around the bladder body okay and then you have the supply on the trigon so at rest and, and note this that we're talking now uh, at rest because they don't play any part in micturation reflex which is about contraction and it's about emptying the bladder so that that, that that is no there is no role in that but at rest when the bladder is filling what it what it basically does is uh, it basically relaxes the tetrusa so that it could accommodate more volume and it contracts the outlet of the bladder right here okay so it will it will contract the bladder neck uh, muscles uh, so that uh, the tone of this uh, internal sphincter is enhanced and it shuts off uh, any dribbling out of the urine so the urine is basically trapped inside the bladder and since its wall is being uh, relaxed by the action of sympathetics uh, at the same time you, you have a pro-filling quote-unquote effect uh, or, uh, in the bladder. So that's the function of uh, uh, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system uh, in the urinary bladder. Then we go on to micturation. Now we, we are starting micturation uh, and uh, on the onset, uh, we need to be clear that when we are, we are, we are talking in, uh, of medicine and, and physiology, uh, we need to make a distinction uh, between the uh, the layman's term, which is urination or voiding, and the micturation. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, say say it in simple terms. Micturation is all that background, backstage. Uh, 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 how, how do I put it? Uh, rehearsal of contractions or or uh, uh, a continuous process. Uh, of uh, volume being added into bladder and that triggering uh, a micturation reflex, which I, I mentioned here as progressive filling of the bladder. Uh, so as you add urine, as you add volume to the bladder, uh, 
uh, the wall gets stretched and it wants to now contract uh, and these are these are called maturation ref uh, reflex contractions and as you add more volume these the amplitude of these contractions increase and uh, uh, the bladder in 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 uh, simple words wants to now uh, get rid of this urine it wants to not all wants come to fruition right so it just wants to do that at higher volumes obviously this want will increase which will duly be uh, uh, messaged to the higher areas uh, as that feeling of wanting to go to the loo and void and get to, uh, this uh, urine out that we, we get when the bladder is now relatively full however urination will not happen uh, micturation you can't control it's something that is inbuilt in the wall uh, of the bladder the detrusor uh, we'll talk about this how is it a hard wired uh, spinal reflex and you, you it, it, it just happens uh, you fill the bladder it will it will give you maturation maturation reflex however urination is that physical sequence of events which leads to voiding which leads to passage of urine through the urethra and out of the body so micturation is that backstage stuff which uh, which is uh, giving you a signal that you know it's time and 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 it wants to empty the bladder uh, with its contractions however urination is that physical act so uh, if you have guessed uh, that it has to do with the external sphincter the skeletal muscle sphincter relaxing then you're right it's that relaxation which is under conscious control which is under your control uh, that causes urination or voiding okay so this is an important distinction to make uh, the rest i think we have pointed out now let's go into the nitty-gritty of the maturation reflex it is an autonomic uh, uh, based spinal reflex as we mentioned the unique part is it is affected by uh, higher centers uh, it can be modulated it can be enhanced or inhibited as as we will uh, talk about uh, in one or two slides further uh, uh, let me repeat that it is an autonomic spinal cord reflex integrated at the sacral segment uh, so bladder and sacral segment are in 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 sync they are one unit uh, as far as the maturation reflex is concerned and it has a it has a very high dependency on the higher centers which keep it uh, numb which keep it inhibited uh, most of the time we're talking about adults here not children not infants uh, in infants it's just gravity uh, urine collects and gravity will just pull it down and off you go simple life in adults, however, uh, social appropriateness obviously is the call of the day, and uh, uh, the ability to hold on to uh, urine volumes is important for our daily functioning. So uh, the maturation reflex is is uh, arrested in inhibition by these higher centers uh, till it's socially appropriate to go and empty the bladder. So. Uh, the automaticity along with the conscious control is an interesting combination and it's a necessity for uh, our uh, routine activities and the components uh, we will uh, discuss it uh, visually in the system metrogram later but just to give you the components that there are three components so when volume is being uh, added to the bladder you have a progressive rapid increase of pressure so when you have a maturation uh, reflex triggered by uh, the, in, uh, the intravesical, uh, vesicle is called, uh, any hollow organ can be called a vesicle. So, uh, so we are talking about the bladder. So when you are adding volume to the bladder, there, there is progressive increase in the volume, which will then at one point trigger the maturation reflex. And when it gets triggered, there is progressive and rapid increase of pressure inside the bladder. Then this pressure will be sustained for a period of, a short period of time and then the pressure will be returned back to basal tone of the bladder so this is a, a, a maturation reflex contraction the pressure goes up it stays there and then it comes down back to a baseline okay uh, it, it will be more clear when we talk about the systematogram uh, this reflex is self regenerative so once you trigger uh, this uh, reflex uh, it doesn't need any external element now it will just turn itself on and on and on and on and it's, it will it's just a cycle a progressive cycle that 
uh, that goes on. So bladder gets stretched by the accumulating volume of urine inside it. Uh, it, it causes a maturation contraction. Uh, then again, the stretch is increased. Uh, then again, you have a maturation contraction and so on and so forth. This is what is meant by regenerative. It just the degree of stretch that keeps on regenerating the reflex. Okay. And it's incremental. So the previous, uh, the, pre the preceding one contraction will be smaller. The proceeding one, the next one will be higher. And then the next one will be higher and higher. So you have an incremental pattern. <clears throat> right. So this is a more uh, uh, user friendly uh, look at the maturation reflex. Uh, it's a simple diagram. It's nice. It's uh, uh, it gives you the two situations: bladder at rest when there is no maturation reflex going on. Uh, see how uh, the bladder is relaxed. Uh, it's being filled. It's called the filling phase in this diagram. Uh, the internal sphincter is contracted so that it doesn't urine doesn't come out into the urethra which will obviously trigger maturation and the skeletal muscle, the external sphincter is contracted tightly by motor neurons uh, from uh, the spinal cord. Uh, uh, you know, the, this is the pudendal nerve and this is under direct control of the higher sinus areas. Okay. So this is what happens when you don't feel any, any urge to go, you're not voiding, uh, uh, things are at peace uh, uh, bladder wise. Okay, so then uh, micturation is explained nicely in this diagram as well. You have a full bladder, much more fuller than it was here. Uh, the stretch receptors have been stretched. Uh, this sensory information, uh, as mentioned, uh, part of the pelvic nerves. So pel basically, pelvic nerves has both fibers: sensory, i.e., afferents, and motor efferents, the parasympathetic ones, which I mentioned earlier. So stretch receptor, when it's activated by the stretching of the bladder. It basically sends down afferents, uh, uh, afferent information down the sensory uh, uh, neuron in the pelvic nerve to the spinal cord, and where it gets, uh, where it's, it has a synapse, an interneuron synapse on the parasympathetic neuron, which is efferent in uh, in this case, which which then goes back to the bladder. Now the stretch receptor is the receptor point. This is the afferent. This is the integration. This is the efferent and the effector organ in this situation is the tetrusal muscle which contracts. What I've just explained to you right here is the reflex arc. This reflex arc will come in very handy when at the end of this lecture we'll be discussing the clinical scenarios. Okay. Right. So you have understood what is the reflex arc of the micturation reflex. This is that reflex arc. All of the components of this arc need to be intact for it to work. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, 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 this whole thing, if it leads to inhibition of the external sphincter, then micturation will lead to voiding. Okay, so we have completed this concept. Okay. Now, this is the systematogram. So basically, uh, uh, first you need to understand what kind of a graph this is. This is a pressure volume graph you would remember that you had a, a similar a sort of uh, concept in lungs when when we were discussing uh, compliance compliance is also a pressure volume graph then uh, heart so in, in heart you also uh, studied a pressure volume uh, diagram to understand how during diastole uh, pressure changes within the heart and how uh, the same happens during systole. So it's it's important to understand that hollow organs, uh, they can be studied and, and they are indeed studied in physiology using these graphs, uh, the pressure and volume graphs, where we introduce uh, a slight, uh, under uh, experimental conditions, we have baseline values. Uh, uh, if you remember the compliance diagram, we deflated the entire lung. Then we inflated it bit by bit by introducing air and, uh, and plotting the corresponding pressure change, right? This is exactly the same. So you pass a urethra up or you pass a catheter up the urethra, you empty the bladder, and then you introduce through the same uh, uh, device, you introduce incremental amounts, 50 ml each of fluid inside the bladder 
uh, uh, and then see the corresponding change in in pressure so if you if you observe you will you will see that there are three components to the to this uh, basal system metrogram uh, one is this this bit here the initial bit where uh, the increase in vol volume uh, led to some increase in uh, the inside pressure then you have a sustained in uh, sustained uh, uh, introduction of volume with little change in pressure and then around this point here uh, rather 300 and above you have any change in volume will have corresponding incre increase in pressure so the curve starts to go up okay if you just concentrate on the thick red line i've just explained to you the three components this is one component which is a, a increase a, is, a, is a direct proportion between volume and pressure then you have a flat flat area where where volume is being accumulated so this is where this is basically where the initial part is where the bladder is completely deflated uh, and you have in, just increased uh, introduced some uh, volume in it uh, so that will register as an increased pressure however since the detuser is arranged in such a brilliant manner that it rearranges itself uh, without much increase in in the pressure on the wall of the bladder as explained earlier uh, you will uh, soon enter a phase of flatness on the volume curve this is where detrusor's architecture is al allowing uh, fluid to accumulate in the bladder however not at the expense of too much pressure it's only after an optimal uh, near uh, uh, we are now uh, nearing the bladder capacity which is around 500 ml really it's around 300 where the the bladder wall is now taut it it, it has enough volume it, it's now taut and now when you add more volume and if you don't void then you're adding more volume and now it will it will register uh, an equivalent increase in in the pressure as you increase the volume okay so this is where the direct proportion or or, or more direct proportion uh, uh, takes place between volume and pressure and beyond 400 you're really asking for it this is really steep and it goes up okay so having done this uh, what are these dotted lines okay you probably guessed it right these and it's written there as well micturation contractions so around 150 100 to 150 uh, things are under control no no excitement and uh, nothing much is happening really uh, but beyond 150 when you go beyond 150 ml approximately uh, you stretch the bladder in in, in an enough manner that it will trigger the aforementioned uh, micturation reflex. So before 150 ml, you won't feel the urge to do anything. But beyond 150, you will feel that slight funny feeling that, you know, something is happening down there, right? So beyond 150, what happens is basically the stretch on the detrusor uh, comes up to an extent uh, that it triggers the reflex, the micturation reflex which then is basically sudden going up of pressure sustain and then dropping back to baseline and we, we talked about it that it's uh, incremental and it's self-regenerative and it's incremental so once you have you have triggered it and you haven't emptied the bladder the second contraction will be higher the next one will be higher the next one will be even higher and you can see that it just goes on and on uh, beyond 400 is actually painful as well to keep the bladder full uh, and on top of that you are having all sorts of uh, strong maturation contractions on on a full bladder okay so it it is painful if you don't void it uh, and you keep on going to the maximum around 500 ml uh, volume it is associated with pain and uh, if memory serves me right that pain is transmitted through the sympathetic so you may want to add that uh, third bit to the sympathetic functionality so these are the micturation uh, contractions which get triggered after one uh, uh, 150 ml of uh, the intrabladder uh, volume and uh, the, the pattern is very clear this is micturation reflex uh, for you uh, the self-regenerative incremental in pattern uh, this diagram is uh, basically uh, 
used clinically to study the pressure volume relationship in your patients of uh, uh, various kinds and uh, the shape of the diagram shows the internal working of the bladder and the micturation reflex which uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, indirectly shows you the circuit uh, integrity of the reflex. So whether the connections are working fine or not, uh, you can just plot this diagram and see how uh, different it is from the normal diagram. And uh, you infer all sorts of information, valuable information on your patient. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is that same diagram which we, we showed you uh, in the uh, functional anatomy part, uh, but this is now the fuller diagram. And it basically, I wanted to show you uh, the whole uh, facilitation and inhibition uh, uh, side of the brain and how it really dominates the, the bladder and the micturation reflex. Uh, so basically it's described as it's a learned reflex in adults, not in infants. Infants is just gravity based uh, uh, voiding of, uh, uh, of the urine. But as you develop, as you myelinate those uh, nerves and you develop the micturation reflex and you develop the CNS and then CNS is facilitatory or inhibitory uh, signal coming down on, on the sacral segments and hence uh, its influence on the micturation reflex develops, uh, you, you sort of then uh, call it a learned reflex uh, in which uh, the, the, the boy after three, four years uh, he, he or she uh, 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 now uh, understands uh, when to go uh, uh, to the loo and when, when, is, when it's not appropriate. So uh, holding on to lower, uh, uh, holding on uh, to uh, on urination at lower volumes of bladder is really something that you learn. Uh, and hence we say that's a learned reflex. How to uh, use the higher centers to, to, to uh, influence the emptying of the bladder. Uh, this is something that you learn uh, along early life and, and then later on as well. That's why we call it a learned reflex. Uh, and, and in most of the day, when you're out and about, uh, the high, it's the high, higher centers which keeps this micturation reflex inhibited. It's like in an, in an arrested uh, state and it's let go only when you want it, okay? Uh, or you're silly enough to keep uh, postponing the inevitable and then it, it goes up to 400 and beyond after which uh, it will have obviously it will co compel the person uh, to visit the important area uh, as we say okay so uh, the urine storage look at this uh, the urine storage uh, uh, he has given two flow charts one is this one is this correlated with this diagram the urine storage is when the cortical inhibition Cortical inhibition means the inhibition exerted by the cerebral cortex and its associate, and its associate areas uh, in coordination with uh, the pontine uh, center uh, is basically stimulating the sympathetic neurons, which uh, we, we mentioned that it's the sympathetics which are pro-filling. So they will relax the detrusor and allow it to fill. And at the same time, uh, stimulation of the somatics, the, the potential nerve, to keep tight contraction of the external sphincter so nothing leaks out. Okay, there obviously is no mention of parasympathetics because uh, this is a urine storage mode. Now switching to the, the, the bladder emptying mode. So cortical inhibition turns to facilitation uh, and it's all you, it's, it's, this is you, this is your consciousness. This is where uh, you control everything. Okay, so now from inhibition, you switch to facilitation along with the pontine areas which then inhibit the somatic neurons, uh, which relaxes the external sphincter, uh, stimulates the parasympathetic neurons. So powerful contraction of the detrusor, uh, which basically is, are the micturation uh, contractions under the parasympathetic control. Uh, they are then allowed to quote unquote express themselves, okay? Uh, since the external sphincter is now relaxed, uh, contraction of micturation contraction and the detrusor will cause urine to flow out which is called voiding uh, of urine okay so this is a nice diagram which gives you the overall uh, functionality of how the whole circuit uh, upstairs quote unquote effects downstairs okay